a real pleasure to be here uh, on an event which is in the live format, which I think is fantastic, uh, and not to have done this in an online format. Uh, I'm going to talk about Generation Z, which is, I hope, most of you here uh, from grades 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, right? Let me begin by a poll. I want to ask you a question. Uh, raise your hand if you know very clearly right now what is it that you want to be as you come out of your high school. Do you want to be a doctor, engineer, or a CA? Just raise your hand if that's what you aspire. Okay, only four or five. All right, how about an entrepreneur? No entrepreneur, my goodness, two, three. Okay, uh, celebrity, one celebrity. Okay, politician, let me see more hands there, right? Okay, no, all right, two, two people. So even if you're not clear as to what you like to be, please relax, okay? That's not the end of life, okay? And for those who are very clear of what they want, I wish you good luck. But there's a very good chance that you may do something else beyond what you've chosen, and that's perfectly normal, all right? I want to talk about what motivates your generation. I have two Gen Z boys at our house. There's Rohan and there's Katan, okay? Now, uh, they are diametrically opposite, but they have very few things in common, one of which is they both want to be an entrepreneur. They read voraciously. They track the stock prices. They find out if OYO goes public, how much is the owner going to make, right? Now, some days when I have a conversation with him, or with them to say that, okay, you know, your journey to entrepreneur, your journey to a CEO is not going to be that easy. And they kind of listen to me. And then other days, they just kind of mock me. And so I say to myself, you know what? I need to go to the temple, and I hope that they see the true picture of how easy or hard this is going to be. So my intent today in the next 15 minutes is to help you distill, as you think about your journey, right? after four years. So time's gonna go back quick by fast, right? So you're gonna come out of school, three years of college, and life is there, waiting for you to do something, right? So, let me begin by just first sharing with you what will be your path like? Having worked with a lot of senior leaders across the globe, my job's taken me to more than 20, 25 countries, and I've worked with the senior most leaders and they all aspire to be very, very successful in their careers, right? When you step out of your college, you're going to start at the bottom there, right? Right at the beginning. You're at the lowest end of the food chain. People will tell you what to do. You will have to listen to them. After a few years, if you are good at your job, you're going to then move to what I call managing others, meaning you will have to manage a group of people who are underneath you. If you continue to be on the track, you will then go to what we call managing managers, meaning you will manage people who are managing people, all right? Then if you go up the ladder, it will be managing a function, which means you could be a CIO, a CMO, a CXO, what we call it, right? If you're still on that ladder, you will then become what we call managing a business, then a group, and then an enterprise. Now, for most of the people who are in this journey, some of them make it up to the top very quickly. And some of them kind of give up or they exhaust somewhere here. It's not because they're not competent. There are, there are things that they feel that, okay, I'm better off doing something else. But for those who make it to the top very quickly, what are the things that they do? So in the next 10 minutes, 12 minutes, I want to distill down what are the two or three things that you can think about when you think about your corporate career. So I am distilling my 20 years of leadership work across the globe to say that try to think of if you want to be successful at a certain level here, when you are at the managing function level, it doesn't matter if you're an engineer, it doesn't matter if you're a chartered accountant, it doesn't matter what is your background. You're going to spend a majority of the time trying to solve people issues. Why people are not collaborating, how to influence people, why there is a conflict in the team. How do I resolve all those? And the more you learn that skill quickly in life, the better you will be moving up that ladder. 
So these are the three things I want to cover uh, as my simple three mantras of how you can go up and create the role of infinity and beyond. First, understanding others. Second, understanding yourself. And third, build the muscle of curiosity. How many of you know Satya Nadala? We all know Satya Nadala, right? He's the pride of India, CEO of Microsoft, recently been elevated to the chairmanship of Microsoft, right? When he took Microsoft, when he took over Microsoft, the big mandate for him was to make Microsoft very innovative. And if you think back and look back to the Microsoft journey, Microsoft in his good old days was a very big, successful company. Some of their products were a monopoly, right? But somewhere in between, it just all went down, right? Newer players came about, smaller players, and they rose and became much bigger than them. So what happened? So what? Because what was happening was that there was a culture in Microsoft where everyone was trying to elbow each other out. Okay? They were not listening to each other. And innovation needs you to be empathetic for the people that are around you. So the first thing that Satya Nadala did when he came back, when he took over, is to say that, look, I'm asking my entire senior leadership team to read this book called The Nonviolent Communication. And he says that I want all my senior leaders and then trickle it down in the organization to be empathetic to the person across me, right? The moment you show empathy, you hear the other person's perspective, ideas are going to flow, innovation is going to come in. And the, mo and the moment he did that, Microsoft's return is turned around, right? And we see that how Microsoft's come back among the four or five big tech companies that we admire. Another one is the Google, right? Google has been consistently ranked in the top 10 companies for the most favorite companies to work for. And these are the 10 things that they look for when you go in and work for Google. The first thing that they look for is be a good coach. They're not looking for you to be the smartest engineer. They are looking for you to be a good coach. They did an experiment at Google that they wanted to find out what does it take to create a high-performing team. And what they found out, and that hypothesis going into this study was that it's the IQ, it's the chemistry of the people, what makes a high-performing team. And they just didn't want a qualitative data. So they went and undertook and created a uh, mission or a project called Project Aristotle. And what Project Aristotle did is that they looked at 180 teams for two years, and they found out one, they found out these five things as to what it takes to be a high-performing team. And the number one thing that they found out, when, it, when you think about the most high-performing teams in an organization, is not the IQ, it's not the chemistry, it is what we call psychological safety. Psychological safety means what? Giving the person the freedom to voice what they think without the fear of any repercussion. If you want innovation, you have to allow free ideas to flow in. I worked with a lot of companies where people go into a conference room and they only wait for instructions to be spoken, right? When they're told, that's when they speak. Innovation doesn't happen that way, right? So what Google found out is that if you can create, if your coach, if your manager can create that environment where ideas are welcome and not judging them, that becomes your basis to good ideas, right? So the more you can do that, It'll, better, it'll be good for you as you rise up that ladder. Spend time. So for, for all of you who are young, when you think about someone who is very difficult, someone who is not really understanding you, take the effort to find out why is that? How do I come around that? That's a skill that requires time and investment. The more you can do that, the better you will climb, the quicker you will climb. Okay, let's talk about the second one, which is understanding yourself. Remember, when you get out to work in the next four, five, six years, you are likely going to be managed by this group of people, Gen Xers. That's me. Okay? Gen Ys. These are the people who were born between 1981 and 96. And perhaps a rare chance you could also have some people who were born in this age, which is what we call baby boomers. Right? Now, it's very important for you to know way you work, okay? If you have a conversation with your parent, this is very typical, right? We have two teenage boys. They always say, you just don't understand. 
because their worldview is very different. My worldview is very different. My worldview is shaped in the context in which I grew up. Their worldview is very different. It's the worldview in which they see fake news. It's the world in which they see Me Too movements. It's a world in which they have lived and experienced a pandemic. It's something that none of us have done, right? It's a world in which they had to study online for two years. None of us had to do that, right? So the more you know yourself, it's better, right? Because it will help you strengthen the context and you can appreciate the person across you. We work with companies where there is a senior manager who is in the silent or the baby boomer generation and there's somebody at the other end of the spectrum, right? So when your father or your parent or someone says that, look, we believe in loyalty, it's because in the context in which they grew up, after independence, if there weren't enough jobs, if they got a good job, they had to hold on to it, right? And now, if you're a person, if someone says, hey, are you going to be with this firm for the next 30 years, you're going to laugh at them because your opportunities have increased so much, right? So it's the context that's driving the behavior. So it's very important, and it's especially, you have to know that these are the three, three generations, two generations that you're going to deal with when you get up in the workforce. There is a generation after Gen Z that's called Generation Alpha. If you think you are digital natives, imagine the people born after the Generation Z, right? They don't know a world without the cell phone. They don't know a world without the online, right? So you have to take the time to understand your context, which will help you appreciate the context of the other people. So to give you an example, I myself am a Generation X, okay? My parents were baby boomers. I have a sibling, I have a brother who is a Gen X. Okay, uh, the spouse is Gen X, kids Gen Y, uh, Gen Z, okay? I work with people who are largely Gen Ys and Gen Zs, so millennials and Gen Zs, right? And my boss is a baby boomer. Now, that's the world in which I am. So you have to appreciate, I need to know what motivates me. I need to know the way I communicate, right? I still prefer to write via email. My son will laugh at me. Dad, why are you doing this when you can use a WhatsApp? <laughs> I was sharing with Uma just earlier today, he was taking an online class, he had a Bluetooth today, I said, where are you going? He had a phone inside, the class was going on, he said, I'm coming back. He went for a short ride and came back, all while the class was going on. I could never imagine that, <laughs> right? It's perfectly normal, right? So I hear a lot of stories from Kathan and Rohan about these things, but that's the context in which they grew. So you need to appreciate other people's context, right? So make sure you get to know yourself, and hopefully it will help you understand the perspective from where the others are coming. And this slide here is going to talk about when you're at the workplace, you will then see what motivates each generation, right? The baby boomer generation is all about authority, formal process. They, they respect the hierarchy. They have loyalty. That's because the time in which they grew up. If you think about Gen Ys and Gen Zs, it's all about attention and engagement. Right? It's a conversation we had with the principal, how hard the teachers have to work over the online education, right, to keep the students engaged, right? Gen Ys have an attention span of eight seconds, Gen Zs have an attention span of four seconds. So imagine the work that the teachers have to do to keep you engaged within that five seconds, four seconds, right? So that's the context in which you have to, you'll be working, so the more you know yourself, Hopefully you can appreciate the context of the people around you and the context in which they grew up. Okay, and since we're on the theme of infinity and beyond, one of the things that I always, when we talk to uh, a lot of the senior leaders, you know, today there is a big buzz about digital transformation. Every company is investing in digital transformation. It's a sexy thing to say, right? But then there are these managers who doubt themselves, I'm not tech savvy. Why is that? Right? There's a lot of work being done on fixed mindset versus growth mindset. It's the personal narrative that's fed into each one of us. So for all of you, right, we heard about the education system uh, in the first presentation. Your personal narrative is extremely important. That's the reason you need to understand yourself. A lot of the leaders that we speak to, they say that, you know what? My parents fed it into me that if I'm not a topper, I'm going to fail. And they struggle with that thinking in their working years as well. 
So you need to question that narrative. I'm not saying that, you know, working hard, getting good marks is a bad thing, but your narrative becomes your prison to the fixed mindset that we all carry. Right? So more you can spend time. That's the reason whoever said in the beginning that the journaling is a good idea, it's a fantastic idea. Journaling will help you to get that personal narrative out. Right? So make sure that you do that and that's in a way you're trying to understand yourself. Okay, and the last thing I want to talk about is being curious. Okay, how many of you here are ambidextrous? Which means you can write with both hands or play cricket with both hands or any other sport with both hands. Anybody? All right, one person. Anyone else? Okay, so don't feel bad that statistics on it are normally in a class, it's 1% of whatever is the class population typically, right? Why is ambidexterity important? Ambidexterity means you're going to do whatever that you do with the same amount and the same efficiency with one hand and the other hand. You take this context into the corporate world. There are companies who have done well with their existing business, but they've also done an extremely good job of always being ahead of the curve, always being ahead of the competition, always being one step ahead of someone else. What is the reason for that? In the pandemic, I am sure you would have been a good customer of Netflix, right? Netflix, Amazon Prime. Yes, I see nods and smiles, right? How did Netflix come about? Recently, the Netflix CEO was interviewed on TV channel and they kept playing that again and again, right? And he said, you know what? <laughs> Back in the day, you, most of you may not be able to appreciate, perhaps this audience here would be appreciate, right? The, there's a company called Blockbuster where if you wanted to watch a movie, you go to the store, you actually buy a VHS tape, take it into your house, watch it, and then return it back. If you don't return it back on time, they will actually penalize you. And that's what happened to the CEO. He couldn't return the video on time. And he said, this is strange. I have to, I have to figure this out if there's a way to come around this, <laughs> right? Why do I have to get up to go buy something why cannot I consume it at my house, at my place? That's how Netflix took birth, right? It was just the sheer, sheer curiosity to see that, can we make the theater experience come home, right? And Blockbuster completely ignored it. Said, oh, it's a fad, not gonna work. A company which is at a billion dollar vanished in a matter of one year, right? And Netflix hasn't stopped at what they're already good at, right? They're now into streaming. Of course, they do a good job of that. But they're into content production. They're also creating web series, movies, and so on. They have, they have invested close to a billion dollars just in sitcoms in India. That's their next curve, because it's the curiosity of what comes out next, right? We also looked at BlackBerry, right? I, can anybody relate to BlackBerry? <laughs> Again, uh, just all the people in the front. So BlackBerry was, Again, like what iPhone is now, right? Uh, and they didn't see what was coming and their death was happening. Juxtapose that to Amazon, right? The Amazon that's become today ran as a company in losses for the longest time, right? Okay, uh, but what rescued them? It's, it's what happened to uh, an employee with the idea of cloud. It's a curiosity to say that can we create a concept called cloud. He wrote a paper, shared it with Jeff Bezos. He said, yes, this might work. And then you know, rest is history, right? Cloud became much bigger than their normal business. And then of course they folded into anything, all the other businesses. So, why is this important? It's important because curiosity is what will keep you going in your coming years. The competition is intense. This is your typical career that we've been fed into for the longest time, right? It's work done by Heather McCowan that says you've got three blocks in your career. You've got the education, you've got the career, you've got retirement. You need to now think differently. It's flipped. And the flipping is like this. You're now going to be there for on the workplace much longer. And the thing that is required is what we call learning agility, which means you need to quickly learn, unlearn. Learn, unlearn. And for you to unlearn and learn again, you need to have curiosity, right? 
That's the challenge that the teachers are facing to keeping you engaged. That's the challenge that the managers will have to face when you're at the workplace. But that's the challenge you will have to also do someday when you're managing someone else. As we heard from someone else earlier, right? As we grow up, our curiosity level goes down. As a, as a, as a, as a young kid, we, are, we see that normally there are close to 300 questions that are being asked. But when we become adults, we ask very procedural questions. How to do this? Is this correct? <laughs> we don't have the natural curiosity that we had once when you were a kid. So please make sure that you keep that curiosity muscle on. And again, here I have three, three quick buckets to tell you what is the curiosity sweet spot. And one is to say that I don't know enough. OK, there's too much. I feel overwhelmed, directionless. The other that says that I know this already, so I don't need to know any more. But the third one is what I would say is what you need to keep in mind. You know just enough, but try and find out more. OK? So you could have the left, you could have the right, but there's enough things that are there on the top where you know just enough and you want to know more. OK? Curiosity is our new competitive advantage. OK, so to summarize, I'm going to say these are my three simple mantras. If you think about wanting to achieve infinity and beyond. One, know thyself. Know your story well. Know the context in which you're operating, right? We had a manager once. We spoke to them. And he said that, you know, every time my father used to take me to the temple, it wasn't the ritual of going to the temple. It was to understand that when you go to the temple, think noble thoughts. Do noble thoughts. And that narrative was there. So the more you know yourself, the better it becomes for you when you're managing others. Spend some time getting to know others. OK, third, be curious, reflect and rewire. So as I conclude, I'm going to leave you with this one slide just as a final reflection. What is it that you're going to start? What is it that you're going to stop? And what is it that you're going to continue as the JGIS student, student leader? Okay, I have great confidence. And you will achieve all that you want, infinity and beyond. Thank you very much.